Hello, hello everyone. Welcome. Today we're here to talk about Dark Souls Prepare to Die, or specifically the DLC. Obviously, uh, the packaging first, uh, pretty basic. The booklet's just in black and white and has pretty basic detail in two languages. Not really too much to really go in there. Packaging, uh, this is, there was no physical version of Prepare to Die aside from the PC edition, which is debatable whether that was much of a uh, physical release since, uh, I think it was all through Steam and Windows Live. <clears throat> and I hit the Windows Live, it was kind of shitty version, so. But, uh, this is a European version of the PS3 version, it's pretty nice. It looks a lot better than the American version, in my opinion, on the uh, PS3, where it just has a generic uh, weird blue flame thing in that. So, <clears throat> so anyway, moving along. Like I said, we're mainly focusing on DLC, maybe a little patch info and stuff, since, you know, it is a repackaging of the previous game and that, but <clears throat> overall, yeah. Um, definitely, if you never play Dark Souls or want to get Dark Souls, I would say get one of the Prepare to Die versions, since you get the game and the DLC with it, as opposed to, you know, just get the game and then you have to buy DLC separate, unless you don't mind the DLC being digital, then that depends on you. But if you live in America, the version I just shown you is from Europe, so uh, you would have to import uh, the PS3 version, unless you happen to know anyone selling it on Amazon or anything, which they're probably all. Uh, 360 version, I do not know if it's region free, so that's something you would have to look up yourself. PC version, well, not much to say there. <clears throat> so, let's mosey along straight to the DLC. Uh, in case you don't know, the DLC deals with the past of uh, basically the forest covenant area a lot. Uh, it encompasses a lot of the forest area and new additional areas. The story basically is unveiling what happened to the Abyss Walker and revealing that something has actually been a lie. The Italian legend of a store, the Abyss Walker, is a lie. It didn't really happen. So what did happen? You shall discover among your journey into the new abyss, or the forced abyss, an oil seal, which is where Lady Dusk is from. Dusk, after you say, basically you have to do a few things to unlock the DLC's uh, entrance. You have to save Dusk, you have to talk to her, and then you get item in the Duke's archives from a new golem mob. And it will make a dark thing appear where Dusk was with the golem, and it will drag you into the past. Dusk gets kidnapped again, and you get asked to go save her from the abyss, the new, this growing abyss that ain't complete. Um, without going in any more than that, um, you get to meet the final part of the uh, four warriors of Gwyn, uh, since you only got to meet Ornstein personally in the original game, you actually get to meet the other three in the DLC. Now, um... In the amount of content, the game's debatable. It's one of those debatey issues where, like, there's really solid content here, but there ain't a ton of it. Like, it's really short content. There's only a few new bosses, which only, to be honest, three are actually need, need to be killed. One is optional. And that's it when it comes to bosses in the DLC. There's an optional dragon you don't have to kill to beat the DLC storyline. And there's the starting boss, a mid-boss, and then the final boss in the Abyss. It's not a whole lot. Um, there are a lot of new items, however. New items, magic net. Now, um... Differing on what kind of builds net you like, this could be kind of a like and dislike thing. Uh, the DLC does tend to really focus a lot on magic users a lot. 
Um, and I think that had a tendency to do with the mass north they did to a lot of equipment, magic, and pyromancing. I think the developers felt that decreasing the power and speed of magic made a lot of people disencouraged in using it a lot. Because magic became a joke to dodge a lot of times now. Along with pyromancing, which was all way easy to dodge to begin with since most is most, except for the Combust spell, will, you know, telegraph through throwing animation, so, you know, you can just get out of there, or you gotta target of that. But, I think the idea was to try and we encourage magic users and sorcery again, but I also feel that focus kind of made the other two a little unfocused. There was one new pyromancing spell in absolutely zero faith. And while my original character on my American game was an intelligence build, the new one that I did in this game was a faith build. And to be honest, that actually was kind of disappointing. I was doing a completely different playstyle. And not that I'm saying that's the game's fault, it just... It seems a little odd to not even at least include one. I mean, Pyromancing got one spell. But Faith got nothing. Not a single thing. You think there could have been something. Uh, there are a few new NPCs. Not too much with them. Um, there are some nice secrets in the game though. And a nice farming area for humanity. Which is certainly quite hands down the best in the entire game. If you have the DLC. There are some new armors. There's really new everything. There's a bunch of weapons, so sorcery. There's, there's a good handful of different things. Um, I think the most interesting thing in it, weapon-wise, with physical weapons, is uh, the two daggers you can get that have kind of a dual-wielding uh, build to them. Um, this is interesting since pretty much all other weapons don't really work well in a kind of attempt to dual wield. You can, but not really crafted well. These two daggers in the DLC are actually crafted with each other, one to be specifically in the offhand, and the other to be in the main, and have dual wielding capabilities. Uh, which, of course, is probably obvious to be a test, since Dark Souls 2 has clearly shown that dual wielding will be a new way to build your character, specifically. So, it's pretty obvious this was probably a test for Dark Souls 2 when it originally came out. To see how players would react to it and how it would work in PvP and that. Um, very interesting. I probably couldn't play like that though. Um, dual wielding, I, I'm very shield person, I gotta have shield. Oh. Um, the boss is all pretty challenging though. Um... The first boss is incredibly quick. Uh, the second boss is actually probably the most disappointing out of them, which is kind of sad considering who it is. Uh, the optional dragon boss, you better be ready. That's a pretty tough fight. I've I've done that fight multiple times through online with people. I see lots of people get mauled a lot. I was lucky to actually get his tail weapon because pretty much all the online matches I did is really hard to get, get his tail off even with multiple people because of how its AI script is. When you're close together, it likes to do all kinds of shit and fly away in that. When you're far away, it likes breathing flames at you all the time. It's really an interesting AI script with it. So it really makes getting its tail cut off really tricky. But it, the sword you get from its tail is very interesting because you can stab it into the ground and it shoots flames everywhere. Uh, cut similar to its breath attack. It has the exact same flame or its black fire, so I would assume it works the same. Um, all the magic, the pyromancing, and the dragon's breath attack, and I would assume the sword's fire animation thing, um, they all do physical damage along with uh, what they are. Like, the pyromancing is fire and physical, the sorcery is physical and sorcery. So, uh, the, it is also very different. Um, the pyromancing itself, uh, the unique spell is like Combust, it's uh, like Black Flame, and it does tons of physical damage. It's great for... Bu bu Man, I'm having more problems. 
it's basically great for breaking shields and shit, people totaling around a lot, you know, there's people trying to go for that backstab that, you know, I mean, not to be that I don't block a lot either, but, I mean, I like to kind of get an idea what the hell, I don't really go for backstabs very often when it comes to PvP, it just seems so unreliable to me. Um, I'm trying to think of stuff to go on, it's... There is some stuff to find. There was a few things randomly thrown around. Um, there's also, um, a lot of people complain about the dark magic. Um, I know Helen really hates the dark magic. Um, there is a way to counter dark magic, though. Um, you will get a pendant if you search or seal, and the pendant will give you a temporary protection from so dark sorcery, which is actually necessity for the final boss. Well, maybe not 100% necessity, but it will certainly help you live a lot easier. Of all, I really did enjoy the DLC, but I really didn't like how it was really short. I mean, four bosses, it's really short content. Um, they also did something very interesting in the Royal Woods, which is the forest covered in the area. Um, basically, when you kill the second boss, it, you know, kills off the area for online. But um, when you activate a sword in conversation with an NPC and you get the dragon boss to be available for summons it reactivates the area for online so PvP and people can be summoned again it's a very interesting design that I wonder if again it was something to test out in Dark Souls 2 if it was that certainly could be a lot of interest, especially since the Cradles said he wanted to try a few bosses that, like, you know, go from, like, point A to point B where the fog gate is and go to the boss. He wanted to make bosses that could maybe surprise you anywhere in the level. Um, and this could actually have something to do with that, possibly, if done right. Uh, the Mule boss is still, the Mule Shield boss is still the only boss, as far as I'm aware of, that's been announced for Dark Souls 2, so we can only, well, that and the Chariot one, but he was only barely shown uh, through footage. Um, so we still don't got a lot of ideas, but I really do feel like it's something they might have been trying to test out for Dark Souls 2, possibly. I feel like there's a lot of test ideas here. Overall, um, if you're an intelligence build, this will add a lot to your arsenal. Pyromancing 1, Faith, nothing. Uh, melee, there's a lot of new gear and weapons in armor sets. Uh, the story is enjoyable. I like some of the nice touches. I wish they went a little more into the Force Covenant, though, because they still kind of seem like out of nowhere. Um, but they do really cover a lot about the Abyss Walker, which is pretty nice. And I like a lot of the uh, unique spites they gave the boss souls in the DLC where all the ones in the original game had just a generic spite that barely had anything different. Um, is there anything else I can think of? Um, ah. Oh yeah, I said I'd go over all the patches maybe. Um... When I started this, there were a lot of new patches uh, since the last time I played. Uh, they added new locations for you to warp to when you get the Lord's Vessel. And they did a few other minor adjustments to a few things, but they didn't really affect too much, in my opinion, to really w worth uh, mentioning. The warp points, I think, was the most drastic thing since the last time I played. Um, I think... Yeah, there's only one new patch, I believe, before the version I have, and that was to fix a flickering problem with the uh, flame effects and that, which had something to do with the DLC, but I was so late on playing the DLC, I didn't even know anything about that until I actually started playing it, and it was the second coming of it. When the DLC launched, it was apparently a problem uh, when it first launched. So, in the end, it does add a lot, and uh, it doesn't affect multiplayer, aside from the fact if you don't have the DLC, you have no real access to it, unless you, a player can physically drop it and give it to you, which they can. If it's a droppable item from the DLC, they can give it to another person. 
Aside from that, you can't get it then, um, which could be seen as a disadvantage when it comes to basically fighting other people, which obviously can't be. Uh, for me and Aaron, uh, before uh, we actually had the DLC, yeah. Though I never played the game when the DLC came out, and basically I got this when... The, well, you know, I have DSL, DLC when I got this, so I was just getting now. Uh, Aaron only recently got through uh, birthday money, so <clears throat> he had to actually be dealing with these things with never being able to really obtain them simply. Uh, it doesn't change the game's final ending or anything, so it uh, doesn't really add anything on that part. It's just its own separate storyline. It's nice little content. I think it's like, what, $15 on PSN and such? So, that is a little bit much for a little content, but it's pretty good content, though. So, like I said, it is an up in the air kind of thing. And that's why I say if you never played Dark, like, you don't own Dark Souls or that, you know, you want to get Dark Souls, um, I would recommend getting the Prepare the Die Edition, especially if you're a PS3 user. Uh, obviously, no problem. So, 360, I don't know if it's region locked. It probably is. But, um, I really don't personally know. You would have to find out. And this is a PC version. I don't really think it's a big thing. But I, I enjoy it. If you're really into Dark Souls, I think you can enjoy it. So, that that's my thoughts on DLC. Sorry there wasn't too much. I mean, it is a short amount of content. And, um, yeah, that's my thoughts. If you got any comments why there is no brightness in here, then, oh, wait. Oh, crap. The Abyss, it's awakening again. Not a thought time. No, no, the legend, the legend.